Welcome back to Fundamentals of Chest Radiography. This is Lesson 2. My name is Dr. Andras Seke, and today I'm going to talk to you about how a chest x-ray is obtained. So, in the radiology department, even though we have sophisticated imaging modalities such as CTs and MRs, etc., the chest x-ray is still the most frequently requested radiology investigation. For example, in Hungary, where there are about 10 million people living, every single year, 2 million chest x-rays are requested for. And I believe that this ratio holds true for every other country in this world. I believe it's so popular because it is relatively safe for the patient, so it's low dose, it's quite fast and cheap, and a lot of medical doctors are familiar with it or they believe that they are familiar with it and uh, this quick view of the chest allows physicians to rule out or confirm numerous abnormalities such as pneumonia, atelectasis, pneumothoraces, effusions, foreign bodies, etc. However, according to the Amer Amer American College of Radiology's appropriateness criteria, it is only appropriate to request a chest x-ray when patients have symptoms. So if you look at this table here, it says that if your patient has no clinical concern on the basis of history or physical examination for any disease, then a chest x-ray is usually not appropriate because here's three, three, and two ratings given. However, if your patient has symptoms that you would like to rule out or confirm, or the patient has increased risks for various diseases or they are older, then a chest x-ray can be appropriate in different clinical settings. Now, when I say chest x-ray, I mean a two-way chest x-ray and the reason we need at least two views of the chest and in general we need two views of the area under investigation in general radiography is because otherwise we might uh, mistakenly interpret the abnormality and miss the true nature of that abnormality. So here you can see Prince Harry from the side, so this would be the lateral view or semi-oblique view of him and uh, apparently he's giving the finger to the media while in reality he was only showing three fingers but that's only apparent if you are facing him or if you're looking at him from a different view and that's how chest x-rays are Generally, one, one view is not enough. We usually need two or, in certain situations, three or four views of the chest. And if that's not enough, then there's, also, then there's always CT. A little bit about uh, the fundamentals of chest X-ray or X-ray imaging. Now, X-rays or photons are high-frequency, short-wavelength electromagnetic radiation. And... Uh, they are generated in these x-ray tubes which haven't changed much ever since they were invented and uh, even though the beam that exits this uh, vacuum glass is um, narrow it's quite divergent that's why we need um, shielding for example and it's quite heterogeneous so that means that there are a lot of um, high frequency photons but there are photons which uh, less energy and that means that the photons will penetrate tissue depending on the material that they enter but the length that they are going to travel is mostly dependent on the amount of energy that they have when they exit the x-ray tube <clears throat> another important aspect of x-ray imaging is that we should always position the body part under investigation 
as close to the imaging medium as possible. Otherwise, the image that we get is going to be distorted in some way. So maybe the heart will appear bigger or shorter, smaller, etc. So it's always important to know what we want to investigate. Here's how a so-called PA chest x-ray is obtained and uh, the equipment that we utilize has of course an x-ray source which in this case is behind the patient. There is a detector. These are digital detectors these days but uh, about 12 years ago when I started my radiology career as a trainee we would have uh, the images printed on films which was very time consuming and uh, that requi re required a lot of um, chemicals so it wasn't that safe for us but uh, today we have all digital equipment so the imaging process has uh, sped up and it's quite safe to the medical staff. Now the patient is uh, asked to face the detector to either be hugging the armrest over here or to have the palms um, on their sides and uh, that's important so that uh, the scapulae rotate out of the image but this I'm going to talk about in a later talk and the central ray is projected at about the level of the fourth thoracic vertebral body and uh, which is not properly shown here is that every single patient should wear some sort of sort of um, shielding a lead apron for example now this lady doesn't have an apron on so this is not it's not uh, exactly correct and uh, when taking a chest x-ray the patient is instructed to take in a deep breath to understand the colors on the chest x-ray which are usually between true black and true white we need to picture two x-ray photons that originate from the x-ray source photon number one is going to exit the x-ray source travel through the lung, the bronchi, the vessels, etc. And when it arrives at the detector, it'll still have a lot of its energy. So when it hits the detector, it'll cause darkening on the film. So the area represented uh, by this uh, photon is going to be dark or transparent, as we call it in uh, radiology terms. If you picture another photon that travels through, let's say, the vertebral bodies or some ribs, sternum, heart, etc., that photon is going to lose a lot of its energy. So when it arrives at the detector, the color represented by the photon is going to be somewhere near true white. And in radiology terms, we call these opaque areas or if it's a lesion then we call them opaque opaque lesions so that leaves us with basically two types of uh, lesions on the chest x-rays we have the opaque or white lesions these would be the metastases the pneumonias or the cancers etc atelectasis for example and then we have the transparent lesions which are for example the bullae or the pneumothoraces or any other cystic uh, diseases that appear on the chest x-ray. The lateral view is, as I mentioned before, very important. Now, when we obtain a lateral view of the patient, the patient is positioned with their uh, side against the film. It's usually the left side that touches the detector, but in certain situations, we ask the patient to turn 180 degrees so that their right side touches the detector the arms should be above the head so that the scapulae are not projecting over the image another important thing regarding the scapulae is that they should be parallel now that's very difficult and that takes a lot of experience so that the scapulae appear parallel on the image 
The central ray is again projected uh, again at the level of the fourth thoracic vertebral body, but it has to go through midway between the anterior and the posterior skin surface of the patient, so it's uh, projected somewhere here. And again, the image is taken with the patient um, taken in a deep breath. Now, not all patients are able to stand up, so we need to have other techniques to image their chests. For supine patients, the x-ray source is in front of them. The detector is positioned behind the patient, so these images are called AP images. And another aspect in which they differ from the P PA chest x-ray is that the distance between the x-ray source and the cassette is shorter than what we have seen before. So it's, it's usually less than 6 feet or less than 180 centimeters. Some patients are able to sit, but they're not able to stand up. So they can be took down to the radiology department where we image them uh, according to their body position. Here we have we would have the x-ray source again in front of them and the detector uh, behind them, but the distance between the x-ray source and the cassette would be very similar to the normal PHS x-ray. Now, why is it important for us to know how the image was generated? Here's an example of a 24-year-old patient who had this image taken first. And on this image, I can see that the heart appears a little bit bigger in all directions compared to what I would expect for his age. And uh, if I wouldn't know that this was a supine image or an AP image, I would call this cardiomegaly. But uh, you can see that when the patient stood up and another image was taken in the PA direction, so the x-ray source was behind the patient and the detector was in front of the patient, the heart is entirely within normal limits. Apical views are requested less frequently because they serve only one purpose. With these views, we would like to demonstrate the lung apices and any lesions that might project over the apices. In these cases, the patients are asked to stand with their back against the film, and uh, they are also asked to step one step forward and then lean back so that their shoulders are touching the film. The central ray is projected at the sternal notch, which would be somewhere over here and over here on this image. The image is taken again at full arrested inspiration, and you can see that here the clavicles appear to be projecting over the APCs, so they are not, so they are no longer obscuring these uh, these apical areas on either side, and we can see that uh, the lung APCs are free of any abnormalities. However, here in this right lung we can see this round pulmonary nodule which might have been visible on the PHS x-ray and thus this apical view was requested so as to confirm the lesion. As I mentioned before today everything is digital in the radiology department and this allows for us to be working under safe in a uh, safe environment and to be working quickly. And this also allows for images to be sent over networks to be transferred between uh, departments or between hospitals. And this has uh, led to the arrival of teleradiology. If you would like to know more about digital radiography and how, how various images are obtained, then I suggest you to view this video. And uh, a lot of my students ask me about mobile devices, whether we use them, whether they can be used for diagnosis. Now, 
We do use mobile devices, but mainly for consultation when we have uh, other clinicians over at our, at our department or we go over for consultation to other departments and we want to discuss cases. Now, taking out a tablet and displaying an image is a very clean and uh, quick way to, to display. But uh, in general, these types of devices are not good for primary reading and they should not be used for primary reading. They should be reserved for learning and, as I said, consultation. And um, if you are interested in this topic, I have authored a paper on this a couple years ago, which um, has been um, quite popular ever since. And uh, you can read in, in detail about this topic. Thank you for your attention and I will see you for lesson three.